Greetings, friends, and welcome to another ministry of the Victory Hour. This ministry brought to you by the Lord's people at Clavel Assembly in Forfter, Rhode Island. ClavelAssembly.com, our website. You can email me, info at ClavelAssembly.com. My name is Jim Gallagher. I'm the pastor at Clavel Assembly, and we're in a series on prophecy, eschatology, asserting that everywhere in the New Testament, we see the teaching that Christ would return in the lifetime of the people to whom he ministered, that Christ would return in the first century. And we did a little short series on Jesus said that, and now we're in a little series that says the apostles taught that Jesus would return in the first century. Now, I've interrupted that series. I thought I was going to interrupt it for one day. <laughs> I guess I'm interrupting it for two days, and then our next posting, we'll get back to that subject matter. Uh, to describe, I, I was um, answering a, uh, a comment or a question that was placed in the comment section of, of my last video. I'll talk about that more in a minute, but I just want to remind you of what the Scripture says. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All. Not your favorite, just your favorite ones. All. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. There's a succinctness to the Word of God, because when God speaks, every word is, is, is God-breathed. Every word has weight and value. God doesn't have wasted words, so he's very precise. Although sometimes he speaks in veiled language, he's very precise. And it made me think also of if Hebrews 4.12, <clears throat> where we're told, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing, and you know, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's meant to cut. It's meant it will achieve the end for which the Lord wields it. Be it for election or reprobation. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joint and marrow and of the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God is so powerful, it discerns the thoughts and the intent of the hidden heart deep within us. The, the Word of God can convict the conscience. Its words are powerful, they are succinct, and they divide. Now, we are, approach the Bible that way. And when it comes to interpreting the Bible, we have to be very careful with our exegesis. Because exegesis is step number one in coming to an accurate determination as to what the Bible is really teaching us. What does it all mean? You first have to take a sentence or a phrase and exegete the text. After that, then you go into the work of interpreting it. Those are not the same thing. I looked up a definition for exegesis. I just did it before I sat down here. And uh, critical analysis of biblical text. That's like the short thing. But let me read what it says. Uh, the, 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 the theological definition of exegesis. Exegesis is a theological term that refers to the critical analysis of biblical text. The word exegesis comes from a Greek word that means to lead out of. Exegesis aims to discover the original intent of a word or passage by the Bible by examining its content, language, and history. So, when it says that the Greek word means to lead out of, you're trying to extract from the text a proper understanding as opposed to reading into the text what you want it to mean. That's called eisegesis. You don't want to do that. Let the Word speak to us. So it's a critical analysis of the text, but the word 
uh, means that you have to discover what the original intent of the word or the phrase that you're exegeting, what it says. Now, as to what it may mean theologically in the bigger picture or eschatologically, that's, that requires interpretation. That's another discipline. But you first have to understand what the sentence is saying. And that's what this whole series on the apostles predicted that Jesus would return in the first century. It's all based on exegesis of certain texts. It's actually straightforward and simple. Uh, we're not really get in, getting into defending interpretations, although interpretations will come out as we talk about it. I just want you to see, the Bible says that he would return in the first century. So, uh, having done that, and looking at these uh, Bible texts, I want to get to, oh yeah, I gotta, I gotta go to my, uh, I gotta go to my own YouTube channel so I can see this, um, Bear with me here. I want Clayville Assembly YouTube official, not the other one, official. And uh, yeah, that's the one I want. Oh, okay, we don't need your commercial. All right, so <laughs> it's not my commercial, it's things they impose on me. So uh, this all came from the last, well, two postings ago here at the Victory Hour that I entitled The Apostles Taught That Jesus Would Return in the First Century. Part four. The apostles taught that Jesus would return in the first century. Part four. And there was a comment uh, made by a, a Doug Dozier. Um, and it's a simple question. He asks, Are you a hyper preterist or a partial preterist? And I kind of went over the first half of my answer last time. I want to do the second half, but let me reread again the first half. And then we'll pick up where we left off. I said, well, some so-called hyper-preterists, in parentheses I put full preterists, would deny that I am one of them. Many partial preterists would probably deny I am one of them. I don't know. I'm a man without a home, it seems. I do not really care about these man-made labels anyways. Judging from your terminology of full preterists as being hyper preterists, it makes me suspicious that you might simply write off any hyper preterist as a heretic. That is what most Christians are taught to do, unfortunately. Maybe that is not what you are doing, but usually that is the trajectory of those who use that term, hyperpeterism. It's, it's a judgmental term built into it. The problem is that we should not come to our conclusions based on the fear tactics of the establishment futurists and the accusatory labels they employ, like hyper. Instead, we should draw our conclusions based on the proper exegesis of the text in question and not worry about labels. Exegesis must come before interpretation. Most everyone who writes to refute my contentions does so by asserting their own interpretations of the text I am talking about, as opposed to exegeting the text under discussion and then showing how my exegesis of the text is wrong. See, that's what they don't do. Until that is done, no real argument against my exegesis of a particular text is being made. So, I think that's where I left off. Yeah, that's where I left off. So, in other words, if I'm saying the night is far spent, well, quoting the apostle, the night is far spent and the day is at hand, I spent maybe 10 minutes talking about what that means. Not so much interpreting it, although that came out, but exegeting the text. Look at the words. The night is far spent. The day, which is as opposed to the night, which comes when the night ends, the day is at hand. Now, so I said, what does that sentence mean? It means exactly what it says. The night is far spent, which means at the time the apostle wrote those words, the majority of the nighttime before the coming of Christ, that's the context, the greater context, 
the majority of the nighttime of him not returning yet has already gone by by the time the apostle wrote that. And then he says, the day when the night ends is at hand. So this long period of time while we wait for the coming of Christ is mostly over. And the day, the new day that dawns at his second coming is near. Which means, if the apostle was writing just decades after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and when he wrote that, the majority of the time without the return of Christ has already gone by, then Christ would have had to have returned, well, in the first century, because the day was at hand. Now, that the words mean, you, and you see the proportion, the night is far spent. Far is a descriptive word of comparison in this sentence, and is supplied by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. We have to take the proportions portrayed in the sentence into account as to the proper exegesis of the text. Now, until someone shows me that's not the proper exegesis of the text, they've not made an argument against what I said. Well, no, the day, the day couldn't be at hand because the, I look out the window and the stars didn't fall from heaven and no new heavens and new earth. And so, therefore, that's not what that, 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 that verse means. <laughs> that, is, that is nonsensical. That is, it's amateur hour. There's no logic to that. They've made no argument. My argument wasn't based on my, my, theory, my, my thoughts of proper interpretation of eschatology. My thoughts were based on the sentence. Now, if I've misunderstood the sentence, you're going to show me from the sentence how I've misunderstood it and have not read it correctly. No one does that. Well, almost no one does that. That's not, I've, that's not an argument. You can't say, oh, no, well, the, the beast is not Mystery Babylon. I mean, the Mystery Babylon is not Jerusalem. It's Rome. And read all my page after page after page of cut and paste of how Rome is. I'm sorry, that's not an argument. I didn't spend my time disproving it was Rome. I was just simply saying, what does the Bible teach about Mystery Babylon? What do the words say? Mystery Babylon is guilty of killing the prophets. What does the Bible say? Kill the well, that's, that gets involved with the interpretation. But you see, we can't mix up interpretation with exegesis. And this series is based on exegesis of words. And what the futurists are doing is saying, well, Jesus didn't say he'd return in the first century. He didn't say he, didn't say he was going to return uh, before, before all of them passed away. He didn't say the night was far spent, but the, the day of his return is at hand. And it's like denial after denial after denial well, then show me how those words don't mean what I said they mean. I don't mean the, I don't mean the interpretation, but the exegesis. All right? I hope I get this point across. Now, i got to deal with the second part of this, or else we'll be going to part three. I don't want to do that. I want to get back to the, the text that teach that the Lord would return in the first century, written, given by the apostles, time at the time of the time. We'll be doing that next time. So let me pick up where we left off. I said, but be that as it may, I do not know what my label should be according to others who proudly bear such labels. Right? Because the partial preterist says, oh, I'm not a hyper preterist. I'm a partial preterist. See, I'm orthodox. I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, the full preterist doesn't appreciate being called a hyper-preterist. In his mind, he's thinking, well, I'm consistent in my preterism. It's full preterism. And I understand that argument. And to say full versus partial is, uh, is a fair comparison. But to say partial versus hyper is like saying orthodox versus unorthodox. You've already come to a conclusion. See my point? So I said, uh, but be that as it may, I do not know what my label should be according to others who proudly bear such labels. And that does not bother me in the least. I do believe the return of Christ, the judgment, and the resurrection happened when he said it would, in the first century 
generation. But I hold to the possibility of some future events still to unfold, limited though they may be. And they're so limited. This is why probably the vast majority of partial preterists say, Pastor Gallagher is no partial preterist. He's saying the second coming in total happened in, in the first century. Yeah, I am saying that. <laughs> Call me what you want. I don't care. That doesn't mean anything to me. At this point in my life, bah! I do believe the return of Christ, the judgment, and the resurrection happened when he said it would in that first century generation. Remember, I already explained to you, I don't believe my resurrection took place then because I won't need a resurrection. We'll talk about that in detail when we get to that subject. I do believe the return of Christ, the judgment, and the resurrection happened when he said it would in that first century generation. But I hold to the possibility of some future events still to unfold, limited though they may be, and it's very limited. It is a minor distinction I have with the full preterist. And this is why, it's a, it, to me, it's a very minor one. It's a minor distinction I have with the full preterist, but many of them, the full preterists, would make a federal case out of such things. I am afraid that such usually stems from the pride of man and of his own opinions. You know, you got to dot all your I's and cross all your T's or your persona non grata. I said, unfortunately, that's how man operates. We human beings love to be in camps. You know, the people leave dispensationalism and they become all millennialists. Then they leave the amillennialism, and they become post-millennialists. Then they leave the post-millennialists, and they become partial preterists, or they kind of blended with the two. The post-millennialists begin to adopt partial preterism. Then they get stronger in their partial preterism, and then they might become full preterists. But everybody needs to be in a camp, because no one feels safe unless you're in a camp. You need a group of people surrounding you saying, you're okay, 100%. You get a stamp of approval. Not really the way to go about it. However, I will say this, if you're going to contradict the massive witness and testimony of the body of Christ that has borne that testimony for hundreds and hundreds of years, you need to think long and hard about your opinion. Who are we to assume we're right and they're all wrong? The problem is, when I say that, then people think, well, that's true. So I can't be lifted up and pro I can't disagree with all those people. And they go right back to thinking what they're thinking because, well, I can't be so lifted up in pride. And what you're doing, you may be thinking that you're humbling yourselves. Well, actually, it's a lazy man's way out and it's the college way out because sometimes someone's going to be a Martin Luther and, and Martin Luther, when they, they said, you've got one day to think about it and you better recant all your writings or... <laughs> And so Luther was given a night to think about it, and he said, he thought to himself, how can all the doctors of the church for a thousand years be wrong? And I'm right about justification by God's grace through faith. How can that be? And he, you know, he questioned himself. That natural Christian humility stuck in, and that's a real thing you need to go through. But in the end, Luther concluded, sola scriptura. It doesn't matter what they all said. If I see it in the word, I must be true to the word. But because I'm disagreeing with all these men, I've got to double check, triple check, quadruple check myself. Well, look, I've, been, I've done that with all these Bible passages about the first century coming. I've reached a dead end road. I have to believe them. I do believe them. And now I don't have to believe them anymore. I get to believe them. When you begin to, when this all begins to sink in, you understand it. The portrait we're painting is even better than what the establishment paints. One day I'll do a little lesson on that, but that'll take a while to get to that point to to do that with you. Um. So we we human beings do love being in camps, but we need to be free. I said we need to be free to think and to postulate on certain passages 
for which we are not 100% convinced of its eschatological import or precise intended meaning. Now, some people might object to that and say, see, you're going to postulate, you're going to theorize. We shouldn't theorize with God's word. You know. Oh, boy. You have to come up, if, if you don't know for sure what a passage is saying, that means the view you're generally holding to feels like it has some holes in it. And God's word has no holes. So in our humility, we would say, well, maybe my view has some holes in it. And I have to be a Berean and search the scriptures and see whether, say, this other view a man's uh, stating holds true, or heaven forbid, we just exegete the text and just go back to the drawing board. And uh, a lot of people won't do that. They just won't do it. It just seems too scary to them. They don't have enough faith to believe that God's word will work itself out, but we've got to trust them. We've got to trust them. We have to be free to postulate. Now, to postulate doesn't mean, well, okay, we're just going to play footloose and fancy free and speculate on God's word and declare it truth. No, that's not what postulating is. You're, 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 You're establishing a working premise, and then you need to test it scripturally to see if it holds. So you have to postulate a working premise Because you can't be dogmatic on whatever issue you're looking at. You may be 85% convinced that a certain perspective on that particular verse is true. But there's a 15% of you that says, but it seems to contradict something over here and over here. But it makes the most sense of anything I've ever read. So it's got to be true. But wait a minute, but what about those doubts? So there's less than 100% assurance of your opinion of the passage. So... You have to be willing to entertain maybe the 15% confusion is deserved, and actually, you're wrong. You have to be willing to humble yourself and be a Berean and search the Scriptures to see whether these other views are so. So you postulate them, and then you've got to test them. And you don't come to a, you say, well, I spent my season of testing, so I'm going to come to a conclusion, and I can't figure out any better, so I'm staying with this. No, that's not what you do. You've got to hold on to your question mark until it's truly resolved. That's honesty, and God will honor honesty in Bible interpretation and exegesis. He will not honor manipulation just to make you feel at peace with yourself and with your brethren. I really, I honestly am trying to help you. Not trying to hurt you. We, but we need to be free to think and to postulate on certain passages, for which we are not one hundred percent convinced of its eschatological import or precise intended meaning. Intended meaning, being free to think. Parentheses, within the confines of faith in Christ, and in the principles of biblical inerrancy. And end of parentheses. Being free to think is the only way we can learn the truth of God's word. If we have doubts, then we have to entertain other views. Maybe there's some information in the Bible we haven't taken into account. And once we take it into account, we say, oh, wait a minute, that's the answer to my 15% doubt about my belief. But now that I see this additional information to add into the equation, that 15% grew from 15 to 95%. Now, I've only got a a 5% assurance that I was originally right because new information came to your mind. See how that works? And you really, it's, it's a beautiful thing. We should be doing that throughout our whole Christian lives, learning from God's Word. But if you're going to If you're going to change a view on something based on changing what the Bible says and denying biblical inerrancy and preservation, or you're going to deny some aspect of the true faith of Christ as it's given in the Bible, then that's not legitimate postulating. In other words, if someone says, well, let's postulate based on the fact that Jesus didn't really die from our sins. Well, I'm not going to postulate based on that. I know. There's zero question 
that Jesus died for the sins of his people. So I'm not going to postulate. I'm not going to waste my time postulating on that. The thing is, sometimes we think we know a thing, and we don't. Because sometimes we have full 100% conviction of an idea because with all the information we have, it's rock solid with no doubts. And then, and sometimes in those circumstances, a new piece of information comes in, then another new piece, and another new piece. And when you add those in, uh oh, 100% assurance just went down to 60%. And then it may take a year or two or five or 10 years or 20 years or 40 years. And then you get another piece of information you, ne- you didn't tie together. And now you're down to 60%, I say, or 40. And now you're down to zero. And you really, you realize what you were 100% sure of. You're 100% sure was wrong now. Eat a little humble pie and grow in grace and enjoy the truths of God's Word and rejoice in the Spirit. It's a good thing to do that. See, that's why I think this this discussion is so important. Being free to think within the confines of faith in Christ and the principle of biblical inerrancy, being free to think is the only way we can learn the truth of God's Word. And then I said to Doug, but thanks for the question. I think I'll talk about this question and matter on my next YouTube. Make that the next two YouTubes. Because <laughs> this is the second one. I'll in, I'll interrupt the series for just one video. Oh, I'm a liar. To address the matter. I do think it is an important subject. All right. Now, he actually did a follow-up. He saw that. I, I posted it and he responded to it right away. I don't know if he's just staring at the, this video. <laughs> he responded almost right after. Um, yeah, he responded an hour later, and I and I didn't write this down till two days after this was posted. But that's fine. I'm glad he's checking it out. Anyway, uh, so Doug has a follow up, and his is uh, he says thank you for the response. See, I I like cordial discourse. Um, that's a good thing. Thank you for your response. I use I use hyper like I would use hyper-Calvinist. There is a difference between hyper-slash-full preterism and partial preterism. That is why I ask. Okay, well, that's good. That's good. But I, I, I think I will say this. I'm going to throw this in. All respect to Doug. All respect to Doug. But um, I don't think people should use hyper-Calvinist either. Even if you don't agree with the five points of Tulip, you shouldn't call it hyper-Calvinism. I mean, that's Calvinism. When you don't believe in total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints, you're not really believing what Calvin believed. And I don't, I don't really care about it being called Calvinism because I'm not a follower of John Calvin. Well, I think he did an excellent work in this area. I'm a Christian. I'm a biblicist. I'm a follower of Christ and of his word. So the Calvinism thing is just a label people use to so I believe in predestination and election, see. But yeah, you shouldn't use the hyper word. I think it's best to leave that off. Um, so you can have a, a true discussion with someone from the other side. If you're talking to someone uh, that's a full preterist as someone who's a partial preterist, and you want to convince them that uh, their full preterism is wrong, you refer to them as hyper preterism, well, you're su- insulting them right up front. You don't need to do that. You don't need to do that. Now, if uh, even even though you may see it as hyper, you're partial. Just call it full. It can still be full and wrong, right? Uh, so then he has one more question, and I can... I don't have the time, but he says, you said, but I ho- you I said, he says, you said, he says to me, Doug does, he says, you said... But I hold to the possibility of some future events to unfold. That's what I said. And then he asked, what are these events? Do you have a last day in your system? And then he gives an example, John 6, 44. Well, my time's up. (laughs) And I will talk about that. And I already kind of have talked about that. Uh, As far as there a last day in the system, you know, now's not the best time to talk about that because we get the cop before the horse. 
let's go back to the series that we were doing, and let me continue to show you that everywhere in the New Testament, the apostles taught in their epistles that Jesus would return in the first century. Next time, we're right back to that business, and um, I hope what we've shared these last two uh, two postings helps. And I thank Doug for the question. Jim Gallagher reminding you in the words of our blessed Lord and Savior, you shall know the truth, and the truth, if you believe it and don't mess around with it, shall make you free.